Okay. So the, the title of my uh, talk today is the Reservoir Characterization of Deep Marine Sediments uh, Offshore Northern Borneo. Uh, and I am uh, Dr. Melissa Johansson, uh, Geoid Energy Limited, uh, Director of Geoid Energy Limited. Um, and I'm obviously a uh, predecessor of the Schlumberger clan and I've worked um, around 12 years in, in Malaysia on and off uh, with a stint in Miri, uh, Kuching and, and Kuala Lumpur. And this work is based on on the, those times um, and a sort of summary of, of really the fasces uh, that uh, you will see and the interpretation of what you'll see in, in the sediments offshore. I'm going to uh, introduce with a structural setting, but I, I obviously realise this is a fairly controversial uh, um, discussion, ongoing discussion, and I do apologise if I if if I'm not. 100% uh, up to date with the structure element. But all I'm trying to do is bring you into the setting. So hopefully it won't impact the sedimentology. So as you all well know, I'm sure you're all experts in the region, but we'll just set the set the scene. Um, what we're going to talk about um, here. Uh, oh, what we're going to talk. Oh, sorry, sorry. What we're going to talk about here is up about Sabah and Brunei. Um, and what we are dealing with is uh, the, the, the Sabah Basin um, and, and, and the Brunei Basin here uh, with the sediments depositing. And we are looking here at the, the West Crocker Formation, um, which part of these deep marine sediments um, that were uh, fed from, from, from the, 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 the highs, the mountain ranges of Kalimantan, uh, and, and actually the crocker formation itself, the flowings into, into the basins. So what is critical to, to, to see here is our Borneo in the context of the South China Sea. And we see that uh, in the Miocene times, we had a seafloor spreading of the South China Sea. And this pushed this, these plates, uh, including the dangerous grounds, into this North Borneo trough here, which you can see a subduction zone. And this subduction zone sort of terminates on the West Barem line. And here we have the Sunder Shelf. So if anyone saw my talk uh, at Perth, where I was talking about the fluvial settings are here, um, they would understand about this being a shallow uh, basin uh, with more fluvial regime. And then actually I was talking at Bangkok SPWLA and I was talking about the Laconian platforms that are within the Sunder Shelf. And today we're going to, to move on into deeper waters um, where we see this, this trough and this slope um, with this these ridge-like um, folds uh, and faults uh, due to this thrust belt and the subduction, which uh, provides a sort of topography, uh, an active, uh, current day active topography where that our deep marine sediments uh, flow from from the um, sediments uh, that the the abundant sediments of, of the onshore Sabah and, and Brunei um, fed by these the the delta um, and, and obviously driven by this sort of uh, tropical uh, climate. <coughs> so the sediments that we um, we were going to look at. <laughs> oh, sorry, can someone turn their mic off? I can hear someone coughing. Um, so, so the sediments we can see are a combination, are driven, the, the characteristics of these sediments are driven by one, the, the Baram uh, Champion Delta providing vast amounts of sediment um, brought by heavy rainfall. Um, Coming into to to the um, onto the shelf top, and we are they are taken to the edge of the uh, the shelf, driven by the the, the fluvial dynamics and the, the delta dynamics and the, the marine dynamics to the shelf edge, and where they accumulate uh, here before we drop off into the slope. What you see here in the, the basin bathymetry is that clear differentiation between the, the shallow Sunder Shelf, Central Laconian area with, with obviously the highs of the 
uh, of the, the the limestone platforms. And here we see this deep trench. And this is where we get these turbidite deposits, uh, the Miocene, driven by that that inclination of the slope. And when we look at a cross section, uh, this cross section is through this uh, area here, this box here. We can see that we have a number of, of active folds um, here, more undulating folds, uh, tightly bound folds that provide a sub basins and topo top topography uh, due to these uh, thrusting uh, areas uh, that cause the ponding of, of the turbidite um, material. And you can see that a flow um, coming off this shelf slope was not going to form a characteristic fan model or meandering channel model when they are following uh, uh, a topographic uh, irregularities. When we look at Brunei, um, this is a section uh, from, if we see here the little diagram with the, the champion field here, this diagram here is from the edge of this field. What we see, and this is the slope, these are, this is a scale, two kilometers. We see that we have the uh, channels coming down the slope. In this case, these are meandering channels driven uh, by the delta, and they could be fed continually by hyperpignal flows um, as we have constant supply with uh, interspersed with uh, turbidity currents during uh, a high monsoonal uh, area and, and maybe a low tide. And, and the recent Congo uh, flow, I, if you saw that uh, footage uh, from from the, uh, reported in the BBC, um, this this was driven by a low sea level and a high monsoonal uh, rainfall that triggered a turbidite that flows down these channels. So these channels could be fed um, continually, as I say, from from a from from the delta, um, but but also triggered as well uh, by a turbidite uh, and of course a tectonic event. We have in addition to this, we have these shell shell, uh, shell diapers. Um, and, and slumping and scarring on the slope. The channels not only do they just meander, they 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 incise and form these canyons, these topographic canyons. So this uh, template here is from this uh, this figure three here. These canyons are shown here of the slope, and we can look at them. We can see that they would focus and be a loci of flow from the shelf. Um, through these canyons. And what we see continually um, of these flows is this acceleration and deflation of the flow as they become confined and unconfined, uh, continue up and down the slope. This is a uh, seafloor topography, uh, a closer view of what we would see um, a little further out into the basin, even once it's come down through the canyon. And we can see that these flows are obviously driven by that topography, these um, shell diapers um, or, or, or fold highs. And we see that they are obviously driven potent, predominantly through the, the gaps between. Uh, some there, there are some overflow um, of the sediment in part, but predominantly we would have them confined, which is going to give you high velocities, high tractional uh, velocity flows, uh, erosion, bypass um, until the, 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 the end of the flow. Um, and then we would have a, a, a nick point, a hydraulic jump as it hits the bottom of another slope and a dropping of the sediment velocities and then a continuation. As you can see here with the flow that when it hits the second boundary, it's now going elongated along the, the the being driven to go round the the barrier as it's lost velocity after the hydraulic jump, so we can see that the controlling factor of your deposition is these is the topography of the subsurface, and the topography is not only driven by these uh, folds and and thrust areas. We are also having topography um, created by the mass transport deposits, which are which are vast, which would cover and, and mass the underlying deposit and create a, a new topography uh, after a flow. When we see a typical log response, here first is the a close up of that, uh, the, the, the fans, the, the high concentration, the deep sessional flows coming down the canyon confined. Um, you see here, this the scale is 10 kilometers. 
And we can see that through the gap, we have that, uh, that uh, bypass. Um, but then we have the hydraulic jump that dumps the sediments just at the exit of the, of the confinement. And then a fan deposit uh, forming here. And then what you see there has been a, uh, a slope failure from these escarpments, creating a mass transport deposit, which is terminated as it eroded the tail end of that uh, fan deposit, creating a whole new topography for, for subsequent flows. And what you can see the, uh, you know, as on continuing after that is another small flow that is capped over the top of that. So this is constant interaction between the flow, uh, um, the high density flows and the mass transport deposits uh, intertwined. And when we look at a typical log, so this is 100 metres of, of log, um, we see this is the gamma ray. We see this mass uh, of sandstone, which uh, you know we could say is coming from here, which we will talk about in detail in, in the um, deposited in these uh, hydraulic jumps. But you can see that when we look at the dip data, so here we have the oil-based imager log, so that's it's why we see so many uh, pads uh, and flaps. Um, we see here the dip data, so this is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, it's in 10 degree angles. The red dips are the um, uh, sandstone cross bedding dips. Uh, these orange are the high angle um, MTCs, mass transport uh, complexes. And then our green dips are the, are the turbidites or the, or the structural. And you see that we have this uh, cross bedded, stacked cross bedded multi story channels in the nick point, uh, followed by a, a mass transport deposit, followed by quiescent quiet period of just uh, uh, turbidites flowing in, uh, low density turbidites flowing within. What we see here, of course, from the neutron density, it appears that only the top of this has got the, the good um, porosity uh, hydrocarbon play as we have some sort of cleaning up of, of the sediment uh, upwards. And this, of course, says just obviously progradation um, of, of the fan. Um, but, but in contrast, the cross bedding suggests a sort of continual flow, a continual traction, um, a, a flow that is has a bit more longevity than just a dumping deep water massive sand. So there's two complex issues or conflicting issues here with these sediments is that I, I seem to have a continual flow regime, but I look uh, as if I'm having a a fan uh, delta that is from a, a episodic event. So what is suggesting that some of these fans are, are long, possibly fed by the, the delta, uh, have a, a bit of a continual flow, um, and then maybe they switch uh, after in a, sep a second episodic event. So, but we will discuss this further as we go through the talk. Um, where we have the, um, we believe we have this MTC down at the bottom, we could interpret this as one of these mass transport deposits. Uh, when we have our stacked sand, we could be here at the hydraulic jump. Um, we are followed by a, it is sandwiched or enveloped with another uh, MTC, uh, where we could have this subsequent flow, which is uh, overlaying the original uh, sand deposit. Uh, and then we have our uh, background or a turbidite regime, uh, where it's in our levee or, um, or see this not levee or slope deposits uh, in between, and we'll probably be much more proximal or a, a sort of abandonment of the of the fan. So when we look at mass transport deposits in a bit more detail, so again, we've got the same uh, log data. We're going, when we see the scale of these things of five kilometers, they can be vast, um, you know, up to 35,000 kilometers squared. Uh, these are absolutely enormous triggers of, of uh, sediment movement. And what is to be borne in mind is that although they are dynamic um, bodies of sediment, so after deposition, there is continual movement. These pressure ridges uh, are moving. Of course, if they're on a slope, you're going to have creep. 
um, you're going to have thrusting. Uh, they they are dynamic after deposition, but they also create a, a a brand new topography. And it's something to be borne in mind when you're in exploration mode is that you have your MTC, you have your sand body uh, above it, and you may then have another MTC, which would then create a whole new topography. And if you have very good seismic, it'd be worth, you know, trying to get the topography if possible. It would obviously be a very good seismic. But as you can see here, this is the surface of the of the of the Brunei coast. Um, you can, you know, you are creating a brand new topography where a new fan is going to 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 form over it. And what you see here is that 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 sand coming through the the, the gap in in the, the the diaper or the raised ridge and flowing uh through the uh area and then truncated as i said through from them mtc following it here we are the interpretation of these bodies when we look at the processes that are involved um we have an initial slide uh, dislocation of the of the rock um, and it can slide on mass with with the bedding in place with a just a, a glide plane so these are obviously a bit more difficult to observe in log data because of course you would have a uh, uh, dip data would be coherent except for a slide structure we then um, as it creates to uh, starts to fail uh, incorporating some uh, fluids we have the the slumping uh, we have coherent folds and then as we incorporate more more fluids as we go down the slope, we can return into a debris flow where we are moving, incorporating plastic flow. Um, and then at the, ta at, the, at the front of this, as we incorporate more and more fluids uh, and erosional and maybe more sediment, we can it can translate into a turbidity current. And there are some elements uh, certainly in, in, in the basin of these being twinned. So you have mass transport deposits and turbidites twin that they are the same uh, flow regime as, as it uh, translates from debris flow to turbidity current <clears throat> and what you see here is a, a log through this is the nmr data here's the t2 cutoff yes you can see a element there that there is some some porosity uh, because many of these flows can incorporate the sandstone bodies uh, of before. So those submarine flans um, are, are eroded uh, and can be incorporated. And certainly into the plastic flows, you would retain some of the bedding. But of course, uh, continuity, um, lateral extent would be difficult to quantify. And what you see here from the dips is that they are um, high angle. We're at 30 to, to, to 70 degrees. We've got some elements of shearing um, uh, within that, that, that uh, bed. And you can see here, this is over 200 meters thick. And, and they can obviously be absolutely massive. When we look at the dip data um, from the... Uh, you know, in a little bit more detail on a, on a, a better uh, angle. You know, we can see the slide um, event um, where we see that dislocation surface. Um, hopefully we do. I mean, it's not guaranteed. There would obviously be a big scale over 100 metres in scale and we sort of decrease in dip within, within that. And you could have a mix of sediment at this point, um, although you're on the slope, so you're more likely to be mudstone with some thin sands, but still you have a coherency of the bedding and the dip. When we look at the uh, slump fold, there is a dip order that you can see that we have this increase in dip and then um, then we have a decrease in dip as we go through the nose. And obviously when you <coughs> um, have an image log, you can see the uh, bullseye effect of going through the slump. And then the debris flow, we can quant uh, you know interpret the debris flow because our dips are now chaotic. Everything's in a different angle um, and they can be high angle dips and low angle dips side by side. These, these features, of course, can be seen in the, the seismic data because of the, the size of them. And we see that these debris flows have this uh, ink, uh, crenulated or, or um, feature with shearing. Uh, sometimes they have, um, uh, you know, have low vis uh, viscosities, uh, responses so that we have a clear seismic data and you can see that this is then you know contrast completely with these turbidite channels 
Um, and, and then in this case, we've sandwiched again into another debris flow. And these units, of course, could be tied into a sequence stratigraphy if you make the assumption that they are triggered at low sea level stand. Um, and you could try to tie that in because you would say that when the sea level is low, um, you you would have uh, you know you would have have an stable slope regime and you would trigger this event as a mass slumping. However, of course, we know we're in a tectonic regime, a tectonic environment, and you know, of course, we could have a episodic triggering uh, of of the uh, slope due to a, a tectonic activity. We also, if we remember the Congo example. It really was just low sea level and it combined with a monsoonal. Um, however, to, to create such a mega event, um, it's, it's more likely to, to be um, maybe a mix of tectonic and, and low sea level that create these events. Um, in addition to the mass transport deposits, we have localised MDTs. Um, and as you can see in, in this example, we have that MTT that's just derived from the slope. It's localized and it's overlaid the fan and, and terminates uh, on the predecessor MTCs. And we see that with that, with this, sorry, this is a sand body that is sandwiched between the two. Now, whether this lower one is that big, massive uh, MTC, we, we don't know because we never logged deeper. We may be able to tie that into the seismic, of course, because anything of that size, we've just said we can see that. So we can certainly tie these bodies into the um, into the seismic data. We, you know, we interpret in this case that with this upper MTC, this uh, 100 meter bed uh, is, is possibly a small localized MTC. The type of sediments that we would see um, within these MTCs, um, bearing in mind when we're offshore Borneo, most of the time we're in oil-based muds. Um, drilling conditions are very difficult. Um, these uh, MTCs are, are very difficult to drill into due to swelling and, and, and um, forming ledges. Uh, so, so the, you know, many a tool is lost. So the, the, we have to often rely on an onshore data and the crocker formation of course, is a, a turbidite formation a, uh, f from the Cretaceous to, to the Miocene, um, and, and some say derived from the Mekong uh, Delta, and this is the distal end. So bearing in mind, we're not going to see the big massive sands because we're, we're, we're way into the basin, but we certainly do see sediments that um, uh, a characteristic of what we would see subsurface. And we obviously see conglomeratic class, um, often mostly clay, rich uh, from erosion, uh, but could be, uh, you know, from the sandstones, pre-lithified sandstones or sediment um, uh, boulders that have fallen off, off, off the cliff. We see the debrites, muddy lig debrites. You see the sort of fluidized flow, um, as we as the plastic flow of a debrite. Um, we see this, this is where we see this sharp line between a, um, a turbidite uh, overlain by a, a debrite flow. Uh, you see it's erosional base, very conglomeratic, very um, uh, chaotic. And then we also have that sort of liquefied uh, element uh, undulation of, of the lamin etrolytics are being deformed by plastic flow. Uh, we've got convolute bedding, um, ripple sandstones in class. So the, the previous lithified sediments being ripped up and incorporated into that plastic flow. And we have large rafts of, of sediment here um, of, of a debrite, a large heterolithic class. So these are the, the types of sediments. It's chaotic. Um, there could be uh, sandstones within it, um, but mostly they are uh, irregular, um, isolated um, and, 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 and could not form uh, reservoir or unless very large. These slope failures, here we look at this in, a, here's a section of, the, again, that sand uh, turbidite pathway, the canyon pathway. You can see here the, the, the dune migration along the pathway, which lends back to that um, interpretation of the cross-bedded 
uh, thick sandstone body um, where we may actually have reworking of the top of these canyons during contrarites forming the dunes. So we, you know, there, there are many plays of, of processes in play in the subsurface, of course, and we don't just have the turbidite and we don't just have um, the, uh, you know, the end of it once the turbidite is deposited. There is a possibility, of course, a strong possibility that you have a reworking of some of the sediment through through contourites uh, post deposition. But of course, it probably just be the top section of this. But anyway, you see these dunes uh, through the, the canyon. And then here we see the that, that, that diaper, uh, the raised ridge. Um, and, and here we have this scar from a localized collapse. Um, and what we see here is, you know, deformed MDTs onto the ridge, uh, the scarp and then the slump localized. And you can this here is um, not uh, from the Borneo region, because, of course, this is a uh, water based mudge imager, but it's from uh, from the Nile Delta, the Nile uh, uh, Delta turbidites offshore uh, Egypt. And, and we but we can see that there is sediments can be can be mapped in a pre failure failure post failure as as an engineer would 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 map these processes and sort of pre failure we have our background sediments uh, very little uh, well no deformation we can see clearly see the sediments and we have here in this case biturbation when we start to see failure we start to see the faulting um, along the, and fracturing along uh, slides we see convolution of the sediments as we, we start to liquefy um, and we start to see flame structures um, uh, within as we as we become plastic flows, we start compacting, we start moving, we start flaming up our structures, uh, dish structures, etc. And then post failure is the block glides, the slumps and the debris flows. And if we start looking at our, you know, you could gather this information from the dip data. Uh, for sure, because you would have uh, uh, uniform low angle dips in the pre failure stage, we would start to see a bit of irregularities in our dip data with some high angle fractures and slides uh, or, or faults. And then when we get to our post failure, we can see the, the blocks and the slumps and the debris flows as chaotic dips. And this is going to give us a cyclicity if we need to, to understand the, the, the failure uh, and the connection of the failure to, to sequence stratigraphy or, or sea level or, or, or tectonic events. When we move on to high density flows, we see that um, as we've talked about these canyons with the, the we have the dune um, reworking, probably contrarite reworking of the sediments on the subsurface. And then as we come out, we are confined here. And then as we come uh, unconfined, um, you know, obviously we have a fan deposition. And what we have is an, a number of processes involved which create those different structures that we saw. And at the base, we have this tractional flow. Um, which is obviously high velocity, erosive, uh, little deposition at all. And as we move away from the base of the uh, flow, we have this. Uh, so we go from a laminar flow where we're just uh, having horizontal uh, sediment movement in a, a um, due to tra traction. As we move up through the section, we incorporate more fluid that we create this the density, the, the, the turbulent flow. Um, and sediment remaining active whilst we can have deposition. So we can have deposition, continual deposition in the tractional layer as we have an inertia flow at, um, flow at the base as the sediments get too compacted to, to flow. And we can deposit whilst we're flowing our turbidite. Now I've got a video. Uh, I'm going to turn the sound off. It's always dangerous having a video in a, in a presentation. But this is just to show you, and it's obviously ancient as you can see, but you can see that they're flowing a, a high density flow into a, a topographic regime. So we're gonna put this concentrated sediment um, a tank into a, a, the, a non-dense flow. And what we see now is the turbidite flowing down the slope. The cloud obviously is a suspension cloud and at the base of the, the cloud is that tractional uh, flow, uh, which can be erosive um, and depositional. 
And what we see there, we form sediments uh, on the mounds because as we go up the, the mound, we actually deposit sediment, uh, certainly the suspended sediment on the mounds, with the coarser material forming in, in the lows. And when we have subsequent flows, of course, we, we're modifying the topography, we're reducing the gradients as we infill the pond between the sediments. And what will happen eventually, of course, is we, after continual flows, we will infill the topography and we will become into a, a horizontal. Um, and these mounds that you see at the top, these sediment mounds, which you think, oh, well, wait a minute, there's sediment mounding at the top of my, uh, it's eroded by subsequent flows and eventually we become horizontal. And what you see here is these thinning onto the slopes um, and then a, a, a sort of thickening as we onlap and we go down into to the basin. Now, this would be a perfect model for our uh, area if we didn't have the MTCs that continually change our topography. So, yes, we would have had our Miocene topography, which would have been subsequently infilled by successive turbidite regimes. But, but because of the active tectonics, we create a, a MTC, we create a new topographic regime. We change the uh, equilibrium of the slopes with the sediment and we, we, we have a new uh, turbidite or uh, regime that follows. And so here we were showing you that, that that flow, these in this case um, have a number of, of drop points. And one of them is that obviously when you come out of the, the, the confined flow, the, 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 that's limited canyon, as soon as we go out of the canyon, we drop the velocity and that is called this hydraulic jump. And that's why that sediment is dumping here. It then follows, you can see that the sediments are a course around here, it continues to flow, and then we get finer and finer as we go away. Um, um, and there may be an element of this progradation because we could, at this point, be having sea level lowering. This could be a result of a sea level change um, as we um, progress outwards with the cross bedding, or we could be just uh, see, you know, increasing power of a, tr of a trigger event as it becomes more powerful, and we progress the, the the sand out into um, to a cleaner, a coarser top. Well, not necessarily coarser, but certainly cleaner. Maybe we we reduce the fine. So so there's there's many elements here uh, in that stacked, but we certainly have traction, and we are forming these cross bedded uh, stacked multi channels. And timing is very difficult to, to determine in these uh, sediments. You know, how long does it take to deposit one of these uh, big sand bodies? Because, of course, the, there's no paleontology to, to tie us in for timing. And they do subsequently erode uh, on top of each other. You can imagine if in that uh, nick point there is sediment deposited, it's going to be eroded, isn't it, as it comes through. And then here we look at the sediments from the Crocker Formation again. Of uh, Remember, these are very distal but there's still some sandy elements to them. They just don't have the thick bodies. And here we see a thick turbidite sandstone bed. Uh, this is the paleo flow here. We have a zoom in uh, to the to the clasts here, and we see pebbles in filling a flute. So this is the way up uh, this way. Um, so the flutes are infilled with these, these gnarly pebbles, which um, are shale clasts rich, and that's from the erosion of the, the sea floor. Uh, we have um, ungraded sandstone with water escape. So this is when we deposit very quickly our sandstone. It still contains a lot of fluids and we start to see uh, the fluid escaping upwards and and and, and forming uh, flute structures, um, not flute structures, sorry, dish structures um, as it gets eroded. And then we here obviously have a classic turbidite um, uh, TA here, the massive sand which is from a flow that has gone from uh, traction all the way up to, to uh, laminar flow, um, uh, turbulent flow, and then suspension, a de deposition of the sediment um, in suspension. And then we have TA, TB, these high uh, laminar flows, 
And then we have these large mud class that are uh, a part of, of the ripped up and deposited. And they are significant uh, because they can occur at boundaries between the change in flow from, from tractional flow to, to, to laminar flow. So you see here we have the flaser, we can see flaser bedding, um, we can see horizontal bedding and we see cross bedding, which is where we what we've seen in that channel. And the sand body geometries, um, we can see that end up ponded, as we've shown in the, in, in the modern day example, uh, between the, the debrites. And we see them being, um, this here is uh, the slope and the basin floor. When we look along strike, uh, we see that these are ponded with debrites possibly eroding in afterwards. Um, and then we see from a dip view that they're sort of sandwiched uh, between the, um, the debrite flows. And we've got low density deposits um, where we are at the margin of these fans. And this may be in this example because, you know, we are, they are quite thick. It, it really just depends how thick they are. You know where 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 we're likely to be. I mean, once you have a mass of thin bedded, you probably have become uh, there's an abandonment or a sea level high stand uh, that you just the sediments aren't reaching the basin. But of course, you can also get uh, thin turbidites um, at the margins of the slope fans where we 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 run out of speed and we we deposit in our our sands, our thin sands, and then we just get the suspension clouds following that. And this is just a, a similar diagram, uh, sorry, 3D seismic reflection of the, of the Brunei coastline. And again, we see this tortuous path, uh, gentle slope. Yeah, it might be gentle, but we go straight into an incline. We have confined flow. We have this sort of capture and drop off here of, of, of uh, uh, erosional bypass sediment a fan depositing here on, on the first ledge and then rejuvenation of the flow during another confined area um, and a pooling, uh, a, a hydraulic jump and then a pooling of the sediments. So you, you're going to imagine now when you're trying to chase this sand in a exploration activity that, the, that your traditional deep marine model of a fan is, is just not applicable to the area. And, and primarily you need to get your structural rate topography of your basin to start mapping your sand bodies. Oops, sorry, wrong way, sorry. Um, so when we look at the, the low density flows in, in, in the, from the, the crocker formation, um, we see the classic interbedded, these laterally extensive. Now, their lateral extent in this case, of course, is, is limited because um, we, we also have topographies. So, but they could be obviously connected to your main fan or your main channel area. So they, they're not necessarily to be discarded. They are, they are often a very uh, good play because by the time the sand gets to this uh, distal point, it's very clean. It's very well sorted um, um, and it's uniform. So because it, it's already been through the whole uh, transition from 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 the shelf uh, to, to the sh shoreline. So the sands are very good. They're very thin. And this is what is the enigma to to the um, to, to the petrophysicist and the subsurface. Um, we see um, a detail, a close up of, of this uh, area here. And we see that we have, you know, structural sands, laminated sands, interbedded with shales. And we can see that, um, you know, the resolution of these, you know, we're now on tens of centimetres. Here's a pen. Um, you know, we need high resolution information from, from the subsurface to resolve this. Uh, some of the sands here, this is D, we have climbing ripples. So it's still very tractional. It's still flow. It's still continual flow. Uh, suggesting as well, you know, climbing ripples as if we, we are still feeding these sediments continually. Um, you know, maybe these flows uh, last days, you know, who knows months if it's a monsoonal trigger. Um, and, and then we see that we have, you know, laminations um cross rippled and this here is more levee deposits which we don't tend to see too many of the levees in this area in our certainly sloped at sediments because of course we're, we're so confined up in that slope region and then we see of course that this is the um you know the response of of, of this interbedded sediments and we're young in this way
And we go to the log days for the thin beds, of course, you know, as you saw, those sands were about 10 to 10 centimetres. We can resolve it through through the high resolution image logs. Um, and, and, and as we've seen that we can, um, we need to resolve them because they're, of course, they're an important play, uh, net play, whereas, you know, a conventional uh, open hole log is you would often dismiss it or maybe you would need to have a secondary cutoff of here or, you know, once you've quantified this, of course, you may be able to 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 pull out these these peaks of sand that coincide with these peaks. Um, but the the important thing is that, you know, this is obviously a time um, in you know, it's time consuming, uh, resource consuming. However, as these can be very good plays, and certainly in the Kike uh, play, these are one of the, the, the highly productive areas uh, of pr production. Um, so because they are, they can be laterally continuous and they, they are homogenous, uh, unlike where we see the ponded area. But of course, it just depends if they're the levee versus the, the distal fan. So to summarise um, the, the talk, this is just a diagram that's sort of telling you the processes that um, these turbidites are going through. We have exhumation and 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 sort of uh, uplift of our on uh, interior uh, mountain range, which obviously provides vast amounts of sediment influx to those 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 deltas, the Champion and the Baram, which is feeding the shelf uh, edge uh, with vast amounts of sediment uh, you know see driven by a tropical regime not only do we have uh, the, the the vast amount of sediment building up at the edge we also have a tectonic process uh, where we have this rift architecture the gravity collapse of, of the shales um, and this uh, tectonic flux or magnetism so we have complex active tectonics uh, active topography uh, not only tectonic related, but as I said, from from generated freshly from the MTCs, and um, which will re uh, uh, realign the topography, so that no, not you know, once you've got a model, you may not be able to continually use the same model um, through the different sand bodies because you could have completely changed your topographic floor, bearing in mind if your your MTC is on such a scale that it's, uh, you know, it's covered your, your, your and the vast amount of the basin. Uh, and the, and this of course it will, you know, if it's highly crenulated and some of the crenulations, you know, are 40 meters plus the, the, the uh, ex, ex, you know, uh, from the ridge to the peak of the crenulations and maybe more. And of course, you're going to sort of pond sediment in it uh, as it flows through. So so we have a, a, um, a complex, you know, if you're trying to build up a patrol model, you know, each sand will, will need to be looked at, each large sand body will need to be looked at individually. Um, the, the best tool, of course, is to have the best seismic resolution, if possible, of, of your, your seafloor topography. Um, we have uh, obviously those uh, localized MTCs that you know you have to try and determine from your large MTCs, which of course you can do from your seismic. Um, you have the large sand bodies, which may not be as laterally extensive, of course, as your your thin beds because they are confined by the topography of the um, and the hydraulic jumps where they've dumped. There is an element to these sediments of, of longevity to the flow, which sort of uh, is, is is probably related to the the constant influx of sediment. So not only do you have a sort of vast turbidite uh, activity, you could also have a hyperpignal flow generating continual turbidity currents uh, down the slope. Um, and obviously, once you have an MTC, you will block off a pathway and you will have it switching, uh, you know, very much like a delta switch. So we see the uplift of the mountain range, abundant rainfall, uh, complex tectonic activity, uh, active tectonics, sediment loading, uh, sequential confined and unconfined flows um, due to slope, uh, downslope due to topography, which causes undulation in the velocity of these flows. Periods of sustained flows, possibly hyperpignal, which can form these stack cross-bedded channels uh, during low stand. 
Uh, and then thin beds can form good reservoirs, um, can be extensive and, and connect, connected to the channels. And then MTCs provide vast seals um, uh, and topography for subsequent flows. Thank you. And any questions? Thank you very much for an absolutely fascinating uh, and instructive talk there, Melissa. Um, uh, I'm glad we did. <laughs> He's gone again. Yeah, yeah we lost Chris. <laughs> yeah. Chris North Wales. <laughs> Duncan's got a question, so Duncan, if you're ready, you should. OK, yes, I put my hand up just now. Yes, I've, I've got a question, actually. The, those really thick, those really thick sort of um, boxcar like sands that you've got, you're talk, talking about 200, 250 metres of sand there with uh, probably very little shale within them. I was just quite intrigued by those. Obviously, these are these, these are these channel complexes. I guess they're going in between the gaps in your topography. But I was just wondering, you know, the, you did mention the possibility that they might be, the, the, it could be a combination of tectonics or they might even be uh, kicked off by, by drops in sea level. So I was just wondering if these, if these sand packages, I mean, they, they look very enticing. Obviously, they're quite a good, reser quite a good reservoir target. But are they constrained in any way by, by stratigraphy? I mean, are they occurring within certain stratigraphic zones or are they all over the place? They they do repeat. They they are repeated, and I my my um you know I I don't know. My feeling is that maybe they're low sea level points where you just bring in sediment from the um, delta, you know, and have a because the cross bedding, although cross bedding is known in you know turbidites, you sort of imagine a turbidite having. You know, you've got to flow it for a considerable amount of time 